Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, the shift to Classroom A. I'm not sure what was with that projector, but it was giving me fits. So we'll use this one instead. Today, we're going to talk about biomarker discovery. Uh, now, this is the, the first lecture where we start hitting the individual technologies that get used for uh, biomarker discovery and verification. Uh, but we're going to start with the discovery of proteomic biomarkers today, and then moving on to set flight verification, etc. But then on the next lecture, uh, on this coming Thursday, we'll be talking about how, how biomarkers discovered through proteomics methods get uh, translated into clinical tests that we can use very cheaply at, an, at a very large scale. So I want you to remember that today and Thursday's lectures are combining together the processes of discovery and verification, and then to clinical deployment, which is where we'll get on Thursday. So uh, they, they all stitch together as one big part. Uh, again, I'm using slides produced by Dr. Beltran, a postdoc who uh, helped us create this class last year. Okay, so we're going to uh, uh, just remind ourselves that biomarkers are uh, easily uh, are, are, from, are using easily attainable uh, clinical specimens. They produce adequate sensitivity, meaning that even at an early stage of a disease, you can detect some sign of that. They have adequate specificity, which means that they don't uh, uh, produce a, a positive for all possible diseases, but just for the ones you're actually interested in. They are clinically applicable. Um, you know, if you have a 100% accurate test for Alzheimer's and all you need is a sample of somebody's brain, that's not very useful. Because generally speaking, we don't go going around in people's skulls. You get it? Uh, so clinical applicability is another one of these things that matters. There are lots of different technologies that we would use for the process of discovering molecules that are useful for this. Proteomics, transcriptomics, and genomics are, relatively speaking, the new kids on the block. You know, in the old days, we might go plumbing around with different uh, antibodies to see if we could find uh, disease-specific uh, antigen responses. So, uh, so these broad net technologies, looking at all the proteins that, uh, visible in cells, looking at all the transcription of uh, tra all the transcripts that are available, all of the different gene sequences uh, to determine. Um, which, uh, which mutations are present in a tumor, for example. These are relatively new ways to go about doing biomarker discovery. And in a lot of respects, it's fair to say that they haven't proved, proven themselves quite as much as we would like. So uh, th these remain technologies that are evolving, and how we interpret them is certainly evolving, evolving as well. All right, so why would proteins be a valuable thing to analyze as, as a biomarker? Um, a lot of people are familiar with sequencers as, as the end-all, be-all of omics, right? You, can, you could sequence all of the genes, uh, all of the protein-coding genes in a human through exome sequencing. You can do that pretty cheaply at, the, at this point. You could uh, go sequencing a whole genome. Uh, that's a little more costly than sequencing just the protein-coding genes, but you could do it. Um, and a lot of people think that we're going to sequence our way into the next realm of biology. But in fact, there are a lot of reasons why studying proteins makes a big difference. So we think of transcription and the regulation processes that come along with that are, are useful in showing us gene expression, right? So we could look at just genetic predilection to say what are the sequences for all the genes in this human being. But if we wanted to understand how their body was responding in a time-defined way, we would probably want to look at gene expression to look at RNA. But there's an awful lot between messenger RNA and action on the, on the molecular, stage, molecular stage. Transcripts are intended as kind of temporary copies of, of genes headed for uh, translation, uh, for protein coding genes. It's, it's true, there are things like uh, uh, RNA molecules that act on, other gene, uh, that act on genes to cause uh, them to transcribe more aggressively and so on. Um, but, Generally speaking, when we're thinking about what biology is happening in this cell right now, we're talking about the interactions of different proteins. So once we, once we move into the, this process by which messenger RNA copies translate into many copies of proteins, we're now in a domain where we're thinking a lot more about the molecules that are actually undertaking actions on the cellular stage. There are a lot of things that, that go on with these proteins, though. Once they're translated, these, these polypeptides are going to go through folding and, and probably some amount of proteolysis if they've got signal peptides. Uh, they get shipped to the right places in cells. Uh, 
They frequently undergo post-translational modification, such as phosphorylation, that can go a long way towards altering the behavior of that protein. And of course, they do have to get shipped and folded to the right places in the cell. You know, if you have an outer membrane transporter and it doesn't make it to the outer membrane, it's not going to be able to carry out its function. So the localization and a lot of the, the, uh, the sequence changes that happen to these amino acids after they're translated gives a protein a fairly complex life. And you're not going to be able to see any of that from the messenger RNA. So we, we really do need to be able to study proteins in order to understand all of the, the biology that's taking place in a cell. Okay. So proteomics uh, is the set of technologies that have grown up basically around the, starting about the time my career began in, in the sciences in the 1990s. Uh, there, there was an awful lot of work going on with mass spectrometry as a, a major technology for proteomics. There have been a lot of people who've worked in, in uh, proteins before that in, in the, the earlier field of protein biochemistry and so on that were doing a lot of gel separations and so on. But these technologies have really grown up a lot in recent years. So we think of this as a post-genomic technology. People can mean a lot of different things by a phrase like that, but I would mostly say that in a lot of respects, proteomics has been genome dependent. In other words, if you don't have a completed genome for that species, it can be very difficult to pursue proteomics because one of the first things we assume is that if we're going to identify the protein, we have a sequence known from genomics already to work from. So we can think of it as a post-genomic technology. Proteomes are very dynamic. There are changes in the locale of, uh, you know, if you look at um, one cell and its neighbor, you could see different proteomic profiles if those cells represent different cell types. So we can have localization differences. We certainly have time differential responses. You know, if you uh, infect cells with uh, a virus today, um, you're going to see a different proteomic profile than you will tomorrow when the infection is, uh, has taken root through those cells. Uh, so uh, these changes may be taking place at the individual protein level, or they may be happening in pairs of proteins or sets of proteins that form interactions with each other. So you can imagine that there's an amazing space of possible proteomic changes that one could look for. Um, now a recent term has been put together by Smith et al. in this 2013 paper called proteoforms. So proteoforms are our way to describe this great diversity of the different products that may be visible at any one point in time from a given gene. All right, so if you have a protein coding gene, you might be in the habit of thinking, well, there's one protein that comes from this one gene, right? It goes one gene, one transcript, one protein. Ah, good, I've got some head shakes back there. You're listening, that's good. So, yes, we, we say that almost every part of what I just said is wrong. Protein coding genes can produce multiple transcripts, right? We call those isoforms. Each of those transcripts, when translated, will give rise to a different protein sequence. But there's also changes that take place in the sequence after a polypeptide is translated. If you have a signal peptide that gets cleaved off, or a propeptide that gets cleaved off, or you have a viral polypeptide that's manufactured and then chopped up into multiple separate proteins, these are, these are really big changes, right? So we, we can think of genetic variation and RNA splicing giving rise to different messenger RNA sequences. Each of those would give rise to different proteoforms. Proteolysis and CLIP signals will truncate these mature polypeptide sequences to a more active form of the protein, typically. And we still have post-translational modification that may modify the chemistry of the amino acids to give rise to yet another proteoform. So even if you start with exactly the same sequence of the transcript, there's still a lot of diversity possible for the protein products. And we call each of those a proteoform. So when someone says, how many proteins are there in humans? It's kind of a, a badly shaped question these days because we can say how many different transcripts have been experimentally attested, and then we say, okay, well, each of those gives rise to a different protein sequence, but that protein sequence is likely to go into this great splat of new proteoforms as bits of it get uh, carved off or, uh, or uh, chemical moieties get added to it uh, subsequently. Those are all proteoforms. 
Okay. Now, I think you remember from last Thursday our discussion of the biomarker pipeline. I, we, we had a, a, big, a big funnel that started with many thousands of different potential molecules, and down at the end, we'd finally narrowed our search to just a very small number of proteins that, that were part of our biomarker set. This is another visualization of the same thing. We start with an unbiased discovery process, we move to a targeted verification process, and then a clinical validation process. And as, as you recall, we started with very few samples because these deep dives into tens of thousands of proteins from, a, from an individual sample can only be carried out at this point on relatively small numbers of samples. So if somebody has a hundred different samples involved in their biomarker discovery, that's actually pretty good. It's, uh, it's not a huge number, but it's, it's the best we can do given months of instrument time given to a particular biomarker search. Okay, next up, we move to a targeted verification. And here, our number of samples has probably risen by an order of magnitude, dealing with hundreds of samples rather than tens of samples. However, concomitant with that, we have to reduce the number of molecules that we're investigating at that time. Before, we might have been considering more than 10,000 proteins now, at targeted verification, we've, we've really cut our, our search space down to a very small number of proteins. In this case, maybe a hundred or more. Finally, when you reach clinical validation, looking for a hundred protein levels for every, uh, every person in your survey is no longer feasible. You need to be using very inexpensive technologies for this measurement because you're going to do it in thousands of people. So, before, in the unbiased discovery step, maybe you're using one of these million dollar mass spectrometers. When you get to targeted verification, you need to be able to uh, run this on less expensive instruments because you're going to be doing, uh, you're going to be spending a lot of time on hundreds of samples. And by the time you get to clinical validation, you're probably using an, an antibody-based approach for an immunoassay. That's the subject for Thursday. So in, the, in today's talk, we're really going to be talking about these first two pieces how do we prime this, this biomarker discovery process? Okay. Great. Uh, now, the, the diagram here tries to cover a lot of ground, and I realize it's probably not all that visible, but you have access to the PDF, and all of this is going to be a lot easier to read there. This slide, though, carries kind of a blueprint for what the whole lecture is about. We start with discovery via 2D gels or, or, or uh, a 2D gel electrophoresis, we're going to continue by talking about discovery via shotgun proteomics. And then there will be some discussion of, of biomarker verification process by selected reaction monitoring. Okay. I, would, I would note that University of Western Cape is actually kind of distinctive in the Western Cape as one of the only sites where you can really do gel-based proteomics. Uh, did you know that this is distinctive in that way? Ah, well, the, you actually have one of the most mature frameworks in, in town for doing 2D gel work followed by uh, tandem mass spectrometry. Most of the other sites in, in, in town that are doing proteomics are using this shotgun proteomics method. So it's kind of a distinction between what's available here and what's available elsewhere. All right. So comparative studies are focused on differentiating cohorts. They're doing something called comparative proteomics. So maybe you have a whole bunch of people who are sick, cases, and a whole bunch of people who aren't sick, controls, and you want to determine how the proteins expressed by both these groups of people differ from each other. That's a fairly simple proposition, right? It's actually difficult to implement, but comparative proteomics has been around for a long time and people continue to get better at it. Complex samples often call for fractionation. Fractionation which means that you turn one sample into multiple samples that each have some subset of the proteins or the peptides uh, that that sample contains. So in, where before you had one sample that was going to require a 90-minute experiment on the mass spec, now you have 10 samples, each of which requires 90 minutes on the mass spec. So in effect, you're trading complexity for time. You're saying, because the sample is so complex, I'm going to divvy it out to different, port, uh, different fractions before I run those individually. We also see that depletion is frequently necessary. Has anyone heard of a depletion column for, say, human uh, biofluids for blood? Okay, well, if you were working in something like blood and you don't do this depletion step, you're going to see a whole lot of peptides for stuff like serum albumin, 
fibrinogen, hemoglobin, and so on. And those proteins are so dominant over everything else that it's like they're just shouting at the street corner and you're trying to listen to a whispered conversation as you walk by. So that's not a very good scenario. So one of the things that we do is selectively remove these major proteins through a depletion column. Okay, so those are some of the things that we may need to do in order to deal with these very complex samples. Um, frequently, in a gel-based workflow like the one that we used here, our, we're going to focus our attention on those things that differ between pairs of cohorts. So we're not going to just identify all the spots on the gel. Instead, we're going to try to figure out which spots are different between, uh, the, between the cohorts and go after those for identification. Shotgun techniques, on the other hand, identify everything up front, and only then do they go after uh, trying to discern which ones are actually differential among those that have been identified. Targeted methods are quite different in that they, they start with a list of proteins that we do care about, and anything else that isn't on that list we basically ignore, thus the name targeted proteomics. So those things are going to show up throughout the lecture today, and I'm going to try to walk through it bit by bit. Okay. Has everyone here had an, an opportunity to run a gel, a, a protein gel? A few people, yes? Yeah, good, good. Do you know that running polyacrylamide gels was the thing that told me I wanted to be a bioinformaticist? I made the mistake one day of reading the, the bottle label in the lab, and I was like, cumulative neurotoxin? What the heck am I doing here? <laughs> so, I mean, congratulations to you for having managed to make it through that stage without freaking out entirely. I, gels kind of scare me, so what can I say? That said, if we want to do our 2D gel separation, we're going to separate the, the proteins on two axes. One is the isoelectric point. Does everyone remember what an isoelectric point is? Ah, okay, a few people, I, I saw a couple people saying, don't call on me, but it, it is, after all, the pH at which the net charge on a protein is neutral. Okay, so we're going to separate the proteins on, the, on an isoelectric strip like this, uh, and through isoelectric <laughs> focusing, then we're, gonna, we're going to transfer the proteins out of the strip into the gel, and we're going to separate them on how quickly they move through the, the agarose, basically. Okay, so small proteins are going to move quickly, large proteins are going to move most slowly, and that's going to give us some idea of their size, because we're doing this in, typically in like SDS, we cause these proteins to stretch out, so the, their linea, their, their, the number of amino acids is effectively going to be what decides how quickly they move through. All right, so in, in a scenario like this, we're gonna rely on imaging. We're going to scan these gels and use that information to, uh, to evaluate whether a protein changes between cohorts or not. That's actually kind of complex. Let's imagine that we have run 10 uh, controls in 2D gels and 10 cases in, in 2D gels. Now we want to say which spots differ. So how do you do that? Do you, do you just stare at a lot, of, a lot of gels and figure it out? It's a really unpleasant way to go. So typically, we're going to use something like gel imaging to produce a high quality bitmap of each of these uh, gels. We're going to perform alignment that allows us to say this spot in this gel corresponds to that spot in that gel. This is a, a mapping process. And finally, we can do a comparison to say, did the amount of intensity we saw for this particular spot change between these two cohorts in a reproducible way? So that's actually kind of complex. Once you've done that, you can then say, I'm interested in this spot right here. I'm going to excise that from the gel. I'm going to perform an in-gel digestion on it to turn it into peptides. And then I can use tandem mass spectrometry to identify it. Now, I think some of you probably attended the, the proteomics module already, so that may seem like old hat. If it's not, um, I'm happy to talk with you about this uh, separately, but those lectures are available online as well. Okay, so that's great. Having done something like this, you might have somebody from your uh, disease cohort and someone from your nominally healthy court, uh, cohort or other, uh, other diseases of this type, and then we can ask, all right, this spot corresponds to this spot. Do we agree with that? All right. Um, this blob, that, that streaky blob there, corresponds to that streaky blob there. In this case, these researchers have said, 
this spot, which is nice and intense in my disease cohort, corresponds to basically a very faint shadow in the other one. And if you see that pattern across lots of gels, you begin to say, ah, this is, an, this is a plausible biomarker candidate for us because it shows up in our disease cohort but doesn't show up in our normal cohort. A lot of times you'll find that there's this sort of sightedness in biomarker studies. You don't often see people going after spots that appear in normal but not in disease. But you do find people going after spots that do appear in disease but not in normal. It's just kind of one of these things that people, uh, uh, one of the, the preferred candidates. If you see this protein, then you suspect you're in trouble, okay? So, there are a lot of people out there who do work in, um, uh, in 2D gels in a different way. The laboratory I came from at Vanderbilt University did a lot of work in something called dyage. Have you heard of dyage? Ah, great, okay. So, yes, in this case, we have uh, three samples that we're running in one gel. So, all three of these mixes are going to be separated in a single gel. We have protein sample one that gets labeled with a Psi 3 dye. We have protein sample 2, and we're going to label that with a Psi 5 dye. But then we make a pool of all the samples that are being analyzed, and that gets run on this pooled internal standard with a Psi 2 dye. Which means that we make three different images of the same gel. One for the Psi 3 wavelength, one for the Psi 2 wavelength, and one for the Psi 5 wavelength. And playing those three images off of each other, we can say which spots are uh, well. In the old days when we were doing microarrays, we would, we would say that one channel was red and one channel was green, and if, if, both, uh, if both channels were present, it would show up as yellow. So in this case, we're, we have something to represent the pool, the pool standard as well. Um, but you can say that if something is reddish, it means that it's found primarily in protein sample one. If it's greenish, it's showing up in protein sample two disproportionately. Okay, so this is the, the kind of structure that you frequently see used in dyage, and um, it's pretty great. If your protein goes into a gel nicely, dyage is really, really powerful for spotting these differences. There are many proteins, however, that don't do a very good job of going into gels. Can someone give me the name of a, a category of proteins that tend to be problematic in gels? Membrane proteins. We want these guys to stay in solution pretty well so that they go into the gel nicely. And membrane proteins aren't happy floating around in water, right? They, their, their native habitat is, is associated with a membrane. So there are things you can do to make membrane proteins go into gels a little better than that. But it's a pretty big category of proteins to be losing if you're looking for um, proteins that, that may be detectable. So that's um, a, a common problem for that. Now we're going to talk a little bit about shotgun proteomics next. This is an uh, increasingly widely used method to find major differences between sets of cohorts. You see a lot of papers of this sort now. I just want to say that in the old days, um, say 20, 2010 and before, people felt pretty comfortable saying we analyzed 10, uh, 10 of this cohort and 10 of that cohort by shotgun proteomics and these are the protein differences we found, that's our paper. That was, that was acceptable before 2010. But these days, you'll find that if you try to publish a paper like that, you're likely to get stopped by the editor of these journals because they've seen hundreds of manuscripts of that type be published, and very, very frequently, the differences that are found in that one study are never seen again by anybody else. There are lots of protein differences that have been claimed that simply don't reproduce when brought to another cohort of samples. There are a lot of reasons why that happens. And, but one of the consequences is that today, if you want to publish a proteomic biomarker difference, you're going to need to have a second experiment that shows that this reproduces by another technology, at least, and in a, in a different cohort of patients, preferably. Just saying that this is how things have changed. Okay, so we're going to start with a complex protein mixture, digest it up to a bunch of peptides. Maybe we use fractionation, if it's a very complex sample like a biopsy. Use liquid chromatography for each fraction. The peptides come out of LC into an electrospray apparatus. We throw many thousands of volts on it. We do two kinds of, of uh, analyses of each peptide. We look at the intact mass of the peptide through high resolution MS. And we break up those peptides to produce fragment ions 
and those are collected in tandem mass spectra. This is the process that we spoke about at length in the proteomics model. All right, so what's good about that? Mass spectrometry has been advancing very rapidly. The first thing that we like to champion is our sensitivity. Now, I would say that proteomics is, is actually a little bit behind in some respects what is achievable by a sequencer. Sequencing technology has improved so much over the, the last couple decades that your ability to detect that a particular transcript is transcribed is quite a lot better than your ability to detect that that protein is being expressed. Do you see what I'm saying? So sequencing technology in general has been more sensitive than has proteomics. With fractionation, that situation has gotten a lot better. And the scan rate at which we produce new tandem mass spectra is always rising. So our ability to produce tandem mass spectra that represents all the different peptides in a mixture has gotten a lot better. Okay, the resolution and mass accuracy that are achievable in, ta in tandem mass spectrometry is pretty stellar. The resolution matters because you want to be able to discern among the, the different peptide ions that are available at any given moment in time. The mass accuracy helps us to identify a much larger fraction of the spectra than, than, than uh, what we used to be able to do. We can work with minute amounts of sample. How much, uh, how much, sample, how much input protein do you need to be able to identify a thousand proteins? Do you need a, a liter of blood? Personally, I would not feel good about getting a liter of blood. That's too much. Even things like pinch biopsies, basically uh, something the size, of, the size of a skin tag, is enough to identify a thousand proteins today. That's kind of astonishing. I mean, the, the amount of sample we needed for the old school mass specs uh, was much greater than that. If you are doing post-translational modification studies, um, you're going to need to do some enrichments and so on, and getting by with a minute amount of sample is going to be much more problematic. But for general protein ID, very small amounts of sample will do just fine. We can easily identify thousands of peptides, uh, thousands of proteins rather, and quantify a great many of them. It's frequently the case that we can identify the peptide um, before we can get a, um, a reproducible enough quantity from it that we can do difference testing on it. So you may be able to identify a thousand proteins, but be able to quantify only 400 of them. That's not an unusual outcome. Um, you will see a lot of people using labeled and label-free methods. So you may be using something like spectral counting, but you might instead use an option like eye track tagging that will let you quantify. We're going to talk about some of those in just a minute. And of course, your ability to to quantify changes, to be able to say this is higher in this cohort than in the other is a relatively easy ask. To say this protein is present at a 20% higher level in one cohort than another is a, is a much more difficult kind of claim to substantiate. At that point you have things like confidence intervals, right? I, my best guess is that this protein is up by 20%, but that could be off by as much as 20% up or down. That would be problematic. All right. So labeled quantitative proteomics has come a really long way. I spent quite a lot of time on that in the quantitation lecture that I did for the proteomics module. I'm not going to repeat all of that here. But the short version is that we have lots of different labeling options. We may label the peptides after we've done our digestions. Uh, in this case, we imagine that we have two, uh, two healthy and two diseased samples, and we run all of them together in what's called an iTrack fourplex so that these samples are mixed together and run on the mass spec together. The tandem mass spectra then contain evidence that lets us know how much sample one, sample two, sample three, and sample four contributed to our seeing that particular peptide. So this is the evidence for a particular peptide. These reporter ions are showing that the, the two healthy samples had relatively little of this peptide. These two bars right here are showing that the disease samples had increased amounts of that peptide. So this is the kind of evidence that iTrack gives us for doing quantitation. You may instead label with heavy labeled um, amino acids that have uh, just heavier isotopes uh, associated with them, which gives you the ability to combine samples in a single run and, and yet discern 
which sample contributed this peptide based on whether or not they have that heavy label with them. Okay, so this, uh, this ability to combine, to, to multiplex together samples is really powerful, but it, it does mean that we have much more expensive reagents typically uh, because of the, the need for the heavy isotopes. Label-free methods have been very popular as well. Um, in this case, each sample is being run independently. This is not multiplexing. And it's cheap in that you don't need to have uh, all these uh, isotopic labels uh, incorporated in your samples. So that's lovely. On the other hand, it gets a lot messier when you're trying to make a really rigorous ratio to say that this protein is up by, as I said, 20%. Something like that would be difficult to substantiate. More typically, label-free methods get used for for saying this protein differs, but I'm not going to say much. I, I'm only going to say it's up in disease and not up in control, and you don't need to go further than that uh, from, with this quantification step. Um, as I mentioned in the uh, quantitation lecture for proteomics, a lot of the people who are using label-free methods use what's called a spectral counting technique to essentially say how many spectra does this protein account for in each of these samples and then using statistical models to evaluate what represents a change or not. You will also see a lot of people, uh, specifically people using MaxQuant, um, which is a very popular software package, using chromatogram-based assessments of peptides to say that the, uh, the amount of signal we saw for this peptide as a function of time was higher in disease than it was in controls, which had just a little small speed bump. All right, so how would you choose a technology on this basis? First off, although you will, in, in proteomics, you will certainly find, at, um, if, I, if I may use a disparaging phrase, fanboys. People who have, gone, who have spent their entire career in one particular technology and thus assume that one technology is perfect for all possible problems. Avoid these people because, frankly, they're not teachable. But um, it's, it's clear that when, when you have a particular clinical situation that you're trying to deal with, a particular kind of data set you're trying to make sense of, um, it, it's quite likely that you're going to need to pick a technology that's adaptable to that purpose. If you're working with biopsies, your ability to, um, to add a heavy label, uh, a heavy labeled arginine and lysine to each of the, those proteins is going to be a real mess. That technology is just not going to be available to you. But if you're doing cell culture, it's kind of a, an easy thing to do. So what, what, your, what uh, type of sample you're using for this is going to be a large part of how you decide what to do. At base, how much money is available very frequently governs which biotechnologies get applied. You will, you will see people put together all kinds of rationales in their grants for uh, why this or that technology will be used or why this N will be used, this number of samples in this cohort and that, but very frequently it comes down to do, do they have enough money to, to have um, a big enough study to detect the effect they're interested in. It's kind of an unfortunate reality, but biotechnology is expensive. I think, uh, it, it, as an easy rule of thumb, uh, I, I think the typical standard for a 90-minute experiment on a tandem mass spectrum is something like $100 or 1500, uh, 1500 grand. So that's not dirt cheap. It's, it's a lot cheaper than it used to be. And our, what, what you can accomplish with one of those experiments is quite a lot better than what you could have 10 years ago. But it's, uh, and it may not even be as expensive as sequencing is. And sequencing has come down in price quickly as well. Um, but generally speaking, if, you, if you're spending 1,500 grand a sample, that's probably a, more or less a worldwide average at this point for a 90 minute experiment. Okay. When people do shotgun proteomics, they frequently assume that they should be seeing all the proteins in that sample. But especially if they're working in biofluids, like plasma and serum, the number of proteins that they're going to get back is almost always going to be disappointing. So I really appreciate that Caroline put in a, a slide for why can't I see anything? So what's wrong? It may be that there's a very large number of proteins in your sample. So if you, uh, if you had perfect godlike knowledge of all proteins that were present in a particular sample, uh, and you were working with a cell line, how many proteins do you think are currently expressed in, a, a, how, how many protein sequences would you say are present in a particular cell line at a given moment in time? 
What's that? 2,000. 2,000. Is, is that high or low? He says low. Okay. Well, how many, how many, how many protein coding genes are there in humans? One of my favorite questions, I have to say. About 20,000. Okay, it's a pretty small number. All right, so 20,000 genes, protein-coded genes, make a human. Um, if each of those were spliced into three or five, let's say five different, uh, five different isoforms, that would mean that we have 100,000 transcripts. And that's probably an underestimate, but let's say 100,000 transcripts. Now that has to cover everything from fetal development to, you know, why Dave is going to need a cane in five years, right? So th th that's a lot of life to cover. So not all 100,000 transcripts are live, are being transcribed all at the same time. So let's say a third of them are. Uh, so maybe we're down at, what, 30,000 different transcripts active at this moment in time for that cell line. Okay, so now with our 30,000 transcripts, we have 30,000 different sequences of proteins being expressed in the sample right now. That doesn't include all the proteoforms that result from signal peptide cleavage or that result from, um, from the decoration by post-translational modifications. But that, that would be 30,000 different proteins you could possibly detect in, in a, this cell line at this moment in time. For proteomics to come back and say, we saw 10,000 proteins in that sample then, is a bit of a, a, a low ball. I mean, the number of proteins that were possibly detectable is now a fraction of all the ones that were actually present. So that's the first bit. We have a very large number of proteins. Not all of them are going to be visible at any given point in time. High dynamic range is a big part of that, especially when you're dealing with biofluids. When you've got a huge amount of albumin in the sample and a vanishingly small amount of a particular, uh, a particular protein that's a good biomarker for you, the dynamic range may be really problematic because the peptides of your interesting protein may not get sampled. Usually, the proteins you're interested in are not the most abundant in the sample. You can see that 98% of the proteins in, uh, that are visible in serum are com comprised albumin and IgGs. Those are probably not the biomarkers you're looking for. But that amount of, no, uh, of, uh, of hollering that these, that these major proteins are going to do can mask what you're trying to look for, which is why we see things like um, de depletion use. If you're working in muscle tissue, particularly that from heart, you may see lots of myosin and actin, but an awful lot less of minority proteins uh, that are underlying that. So being able to reduce the complexity through depletion, enrichment, and fractionation can do a lot of good for allowing you to see this underlayer of proteins that are probably more clinically relevant for you. However, being consistent and careful in how you do sample preparation is everything. There's a lot, there are a lot of people in proteomics who have a great reputation for good hands. I'm not one of them. I deal with data, right? So I, I guess they think I have a good mind, haven't helped them. But Good hands, not my aspect. There, when, when, you, when you encounter somebody who has good hands for proteomics experiments, you keep them, by all means. And you have to consider off-target effects if you're relying on depletion, enrichment, and fractionation. Remember that every step you add to your, analytic, to your workbench uh, protocol for getting samples ready for the mass spec, every step you add introduces its own variability. And if you deplete for major proteins, you're probably also depleting a small amount of other proteins that are not targeted by that depletion column. That can be really problematic if the protein you're depleting accidentally is the protein you're actually interested in. Okay, we spoke then about shotgun proteomics as a discovery method. Next, though, we're going to need to scale up to hundreds of samples. And if we do that, we're really going to want a targeted proteomics approach. So we still have the digestion to peptides, we still use liquid chromatography, we're still using electrospray. And we are going to use a mass spectrometer, but we're not going to be using one of those really expensive ones that can take us a long time to get onto. Instead, we'll probably use something like a triple quadrupole instrument. 
These are, these are not instruments that you find huge numbers of in proteomics in South Africa just yet. Um, but it's kind of ironic because they're a lot less expensive than these uh, massive Orbitrap instruments. And they're very, very good for confirming the differences that we claim based on shotgun proteomics. So we use a, uh, we have three quadrupoles in a triple quadrupole. <laughs> I think that part should be obvious, but what is a quadrupole? A quadrupole is a set of four electrodes that allow you to, to create something called a mass filter, to be able to say, I want no ion except those that are close to this particular target mass to charge value. So this mass filter, this in Q1, the first quadrupole, is set to screen out everything that isn't this particular peptide's mass to charge value. So those peptides pass through, the other ions don't. Next, we perform CID, we add a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of gas in this collision cell, quadru quadruple two. We cause the ions to move around, they bounce off of the gas molecules, they heat up, and they break to produce fragment ions. Finally, we use quadrupole three, which is again set to a mass filter mode to say, I only want fragment ions that have this mass. Only those are allowed to pass. And by sampling this peptide over time, we're able to make measurements that reflect its rise in intensity as that peptide first appears from chromatography and falls back to Earth as it, as it finishes its solution. These chromatograms are then integrated to make an estimate of how much of that there is. So I would note that the instrument is ignoring the vast majority of peptides and uh, peptide ions that are in these mixtures. They are only analyzing, they're only allowing the passage of peptide ions that meet this criterion and a fragment from that peptide that meets this criterion. Okay, so how does that work? In, in a, this is called a Selected Reaction Monitoring Experiment, or an SRM. Frequently, um, you'll, you'll find the proteomics people just rely on that jargon. They just call it an SRM. Um, so it's, it's worth your time to know that that's a, what a Selected Reaction Monitoring Experiment is. Its whole design is to collect chromatograms for ions that meet these two criteria. Each chromatogram corresponds to something called a transition. That's a really important vocabulary term, which is why I bolded it and italicized it. Sorry, sometimes I give away my quiz questions. I haven't written them yet, but I, I can just assure you that would be on there. So each transition reflects a particular combination of a peptide's mass to charge value and a particular fragment ion from it. You see? So in, in this prior diagram, I just showed it set up for one particular transition. We're going to allow this peptide through, we're going to blow it up, and then we're going to measure how much of this particular fragment was generated from it. Right? That's one transition. But the instrument can cycle through lots of different transitions. So instead of measuring for one particular peptide and one particular fragment, you know, every few milliseconds, the instrument is cycling among a set of different peptides looking at multiple fragments for each. So let's imagine that we want to measure about 50 proteins very carefully. Our PI says uh, this pathway is probably related to the phenotype. So I want to measure every protein in this pathway. You could imagine a PI saying something like that, right, professor? So let us imagine then that the PI says, this pathway is interesting, you find these 50 proteins and you want to measure each of them across this cohort of samples. So now you can say, each protein will be, multiple, will be measured on multiple lines of evidence. We're going to measure three different peptides for each protein on our list. But each peptide, in turn, can produce multiple fragment ions. So we're going to measure three different fragment ions for each peptide. So I hope you can see from that that 50 proteins give rise to 150 peptides that you're going to measure. And those 150 peptides you want to measure, we're going to measure three fragments from each, which gives us a total list of 450 transitions in one 90-minute experiment. So you're going to get back a lot of information, but it all relates to just those 50 proteins. Okay. So frequently you will see that people try to improve the quality of the chromatograms that they produce by using a technique called scheduling. Scheduling means that 
you know from experience that this peptide always shows up at about 20 minutes through the chromatography. Therefore, you don't need to go looking for it at 40 minutes. You only need to look for it at 20 minutes. So the instrument has this, this uh, ability to, tell, to say, only look for this peptide during the, this time interval, which gives you the ability to get good chromatograms for early peptides and late peptides in a way where they're not interfering with each other, or they're not uh, being measured at the same time. Okay. So a lot of take-home messages I appreciate. Uh, but what I, what I hope you take away is that shotgun methods and gel methods can help us spot proteins that differentiate pairs of cohorts. Having done that, we need to confirm them. We need to verify those potential biomarkers in a larger number of people using a more targeted technology like SRM. Okay, proteomic biomarkers are a good thing to measure because they're close to the action. They are the actors on the cellular stage. So being able to measure them well makes a big difference. Prefraction pre 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 and depletion is often required with clinical samples to deal with the incredible sample complexity. Measuring 10,000 proteins does not typically come from a single mass spec instrument, uh, a single mass spec uh, run. Typically, we're going to use fractionation to get a really deep catalog. Gel-based methods have been used for a long time. In practice, we have seen that they comprise a smaller and smaller fraction of published proteomics papers. So uh, a lot of people who are accustomed to LC, MSMS based approaches tend to, to sneer a little bit at gel uh, research, but in fact, gel-based proteomics has been around for quite a long time and it has a rather distinguished history. So I, I would not want you to, to inherit my biases in that respect. Differentiation is possible in shotgun experiments, and you can use label-free and labeled approaches, isotopic labeling methods, but when you want a quantitative result to be able to say, this protein is changing by this much, with this, much, uh, with this confidence interval around it, building it around a targeted quantitation experiment, like an SRM study, is a much better option for you. Biomarker searches will frequently start with something like a shotgun experiment in tens of people, and will have gradually become a set of transitions measured in SRM experiments that include hundreds of people. That does not, however, get us to an application where we can measure thousands of people. For that, we almost always change to an antibody type of assay, and that's what we'll be talking about on Thursday.